Today's department is the business and marketing department. You know, if you market your business better, you will make more money. That's why in this conversation, we're gonna be talking about how to make more money with your business using a personal brand, and then how to save your money with taxes. I have with me Carter Cofield, an eight-figure tax strategist who is also killing it with his personal brand. Instead of going to find all these clients and beg them to pay me, why don't I sit still and make myself more findable? You can't build a valuable personal brand overnight. I can try to beg these people to start taking me seriously, or I can become worthy of their attention through my content, through my brand. So you starting out, how did you even know what to say and like what to make videos on? Most people never ask their audience what they wanna know. Put your ego aside and start making content that your audience wants you to make. Being knowledgeable about what you do is a prerequisite for success. It will not guarantee success. And so you have to balance being an expert in what you do, but being able to tell it or teach it in a way that other people can understand. If you wanna be successful, guys, please hear me out. If you have more followers than dollars, it's a problem. The goal is to have the followers, but the, also the goal is to turn them followers into buyers eventually. So the way we do it is we... I'm so excited to have my friend with me, Carter Cofield, who is an eight-figure entrepreneur. He's a tax strategist helping businesses structure their business so that they can not only, you say, make the bag, but also keep the bag. He's also been named the number one CPA for millennials. But what I love most about Carter, honestly, is how he's built his personal brand to drive his service-based business. And so we're gonna get into a lot of it in this conversation from building your personal brand, what you should be doing and what you, how you can use Instagram to really make more money in your business. And then we'll get into some tax strategies. Bro, I appreciate you for being on. No, thank you, brother, man. Yeah. Happy to be here. Dude. Hey, to rock, man. I actually, I've been following you more, you know, and I've also been in the same rooms, but we never like shook hands until yes. I would say over a year later. So like, uh, I, I was following you and then uh, Neo's mastermind in 2023, you spoke a couple people before me mm -hmm. and I was just like chilling in the back. I'm just like, dude, I'm like my introvert self. <laughs> and you were breaking down like the challenge strategy just yeah. from the dome. And it was, uh, it was so enlightening. And then, um, and I think, uh, yeah, there was like the mastermind where you got your seven day award or the, the event you spoke at Myron's uh, offer mastery event. Oh yeah, 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 right. So that was right. another instance. Yeah. And then- uh, Dude, you were there the whole time. Dude, I was there the whole time. That's crazy. But it's- It's, it's crazy because like the, when we met, like two weeks before we met, I was like researching you. I'm like, I, I gotta meet this dude yeah. next time I see him in the room and then you were in the mastermind. I think that's just a testament of like, if you wanna be successful, get around success. For sure. It will happen. Like yeah. your environment is the most important thing that you can do for yourself and your future. And the reason we connected um, you know, as, as dope as being online is, the reason we connected was being in the same room. Mm -hmm. So if any advice to your audience, like get in as many rooms as possible with high level people and you'll be successful on accident. So good, on accident. On accident. I feel that. Stumble into success. <laughs> Stumble into success. <laughs> I do wanna get your perspective on why you felt like it was important to build your personal brand because there are there's a ton of people, most people that listen to this probably sell a product, have a service, they do something in exchange for money and you know, sometimes we could focus on the service or the delivery system or what have you, but you've prioritized building your brand online, sp specifically on Instagram. And, and I don't even want to get into the nitty gritty of like the type of content you post, but mm -hmm. what made it important to you? What made building a personal brand important to me was imposter syndrome. Let me tell you why. So I started out working in corporate America, big four accounting firm, right? Like when you graduate as an accountant, that's your main thing you wanna do, work for a big four accounting firm. I did that and it was one of the hardest experiences of my life because being an African-American mm -hmm. with the beard, with tattoos from the South side of Chicago. This cut. This cut, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, this cut. Um, I was just automatically a target for like, you know, just like racial discrimination at work. Like, sure. you know what I'm saying? Like not getting promoted, not doing the things like, um, I remember one time uh, my manager told me, because I had bought a Dodge Challenger, because I was making good money and I was saving my money. They told me I have to park two buildings down and walk to work. Oh, wow. Because my, I had a better car than the partner on the account. So, dude, like, by the time I quit, I was so, like, just beat down and didn't really believe in myself when I, like, was going to start my business. I started my business because I didn't, it was like, start a business or continue dealing with this. Sure. Right? So um, being a 24-year-old 
CPA trying to get people to pay you is hard. Mm -hmm. So I, so my thought process was I can try to beg these people to start taking me seriously, or I can become worthy of their attention through my content, through my mm -hmm. brand. And instead of, instead of going to find all these clients and beg them to pay me, why don't I sit still and make myself more findable? It's good. So that when people do come to me, I don't have to prove myself as much. Right. So for me, uh, it was, I built the personal brand came out of imposter syndrome and like doing what I feel like I had to do to be a sought out financial expert. And then how, how long do you feel like you committed to posting consistently where you were like, oh, wow, this is actually working? Yeah. So you have to work without looking at the results, man. Yeah. Uh, Alex Mimosi talks about this a lot. Like the work you might think is not working, but it's not working for you yet, but that's because it's working on you. Mm -hmm. So I started putting out content on Instagram, at least late 2019, early 2020. Um, so like getting close to COVID and um, I, my goal was one video a day. Mm -hmm. Like one, like one post a day. Like I don't, like I don't care what you do. Post on social once a day. And when I started, I maybe had two thousand followers. It was like all my friends and family, and um, just found a framework that was easy. Because here's what I knew: I knew that if I made creating content difficult, I wasn't going to do it. That's so good, right? Right. Because that's already a barrier right yeah. there that you're putting in front of yourself. So I said, let me figure out the easiest way to make content. Not because I'm lazy, but I want to like discipline my environment by making it easy. Mm. So my first videos, dude, was tripod, <laughs> sideways, white background, talk. <laughs> and dude, I would just like do like 10 of them. And then I would like download, I think I was using a cap cut that I would like add the captions later. But I would like... I would make sure I recorded 15, 10 or 15 videos first yeah. and then edit it. Cause you know, if you start editing, you might take two hours doing that. Now no, you only thanks. got one video. So I yeah. would do like batch 10 to 15 edit. That's two weeks of content. Yeah. I made in a day. Yep. So that was kind of my initial posting schedule. And um, one post a day turned into two posts a day, which turned into three posts a day. And now we're about three, three or four posts a day. That's so good. Yeah. And like you were doing it by yourself initially. Oh, I had, it was just me. It was just you. And then how long till you started inviting work uh, help, like hired help? Too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too long because then I became a perfectionist over my content. And it was like, all right, well, I'm good at this. This is my thing now. Mm. Nobody can do it better than me. So it became really time consuming because it became my baby. Yeah. And then it was probably only until maybe maybe two years ago. So like 2022, it's like the first two years I was doing it just me and then I hired somebody who could like schedule the post. You're still not touching my content, bro. <laughs> you can schedule but it. like you can you can you can schedule it out. <laughs> and funny. then um it went into having a now we have a full content team and I don't even know what things are getting posted. Yeah. Sometimes. So so you starting out, how did you even know what to say and like what to make videos on? Like what was your framework that you followed and i know I, you're tracing back now like it's crazy to think that that was five years ago but yeah, like, yeah. it's crazy so yeah. i'm like why does it feel so hard to remember this um so it's two very very important things number one which so many people don't do like how do i know what my audience wants to me to make content about how do i know what to post about one of the bible verses says ask and you shall receive mm. Most people never ask their audience what they want to know. Mm, that's good. Like just poll your audience. Hey, what is your biggest challenge with X? To me, hey guys, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to saving on taxes? I don't know how to write off my home office. I don't know how to write off my rent. I don't know how to make my personal expenses. Like, thank you for telling me. Now I'm going to make five pieces of content about every topic that you all made, that you all uh, responded. And now I have 25 pieces of content. That's good. Um, so number one is X. And number two, do I study my craft? That's good. So much. Because honestly, I didn't want anybody to ask me a question I didn't have the answer. I thought I thought, I thought somebody asked you the question and you didn't, have, you didn't have the answer. You weren't an expert. Yeah. So I was like, I need to research or... Um, dedicate myself so much to my craft that there will never be a question that I can't answer. So I read every book I can get my hands on, took every class I can get my hands on, signed up for every tax program I can get my hands on so that anytime somebody asks me a question, I would have an answer. So that that made also made it really 
it's uh, easy to make content about. Cause I so so like you may, I mean, you mentioned that, that one scripture that's in new, the new Testament in the gospels. Dude, second Timothy, which is a letter written by apostle Paul. He says, study yourself approved, which is, it's just, you're a, I mean, like sometimes you don't realize, we don't realize as business owners that when we apply principles in our lives, whether we don't know it or not, maybe we saw somebody else apply it, that it just, it just works. But like you create it because there's, it's just, it's just a, it's a stumbling block for some people. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what to talk about. Well, it's like, well, I'm, it's, it's hard to tell somebody if you don't know what to talk about, you're talk about it. Talk yeah, about it. You're just not worthy <laughs> yeah. of being listened to. Yeah. <laughs> like if you cannot some people be like um man i can't make a youtube video about what i'm an expert in yeah. sorry bro you're probably not an expert then because right. you should know enough about your craft to be able to talk hours yeah i, I actually saw darius daniels posted a couple of days ago about how he never has he's never afraid of giving away too much information because he'll never be able to give all the way give all the information away <sighs> the, dude um somebody asked me a similar question about like Dude, if you're teaching a webinar or a masterclass, how do you like not give away all your secrets? I'm like, Dude. bro, all people could take from me is notes. <laughs> this bag is full, okay? Yeah. I couldn't give all this game away if I tried to. Yeah. So I think that's a like a lesson to everybody at home. And this is real talk for me. Like I'm talking to myself through this podcast. The reason I felt the imposter syndrome when I started my business is because I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Mm. And that's just a realization I had to face. Like, yeah. The imposter syndrome came from me partially being an imposter. I wasn't who I thought I was. And guess what? That's okay. Yeah. Because life is about learning. Life is about growing. And so like, if, if enough people will like look themselves in the mirror and say, hey, I'm not as good as I think I am, but I'm going to work as hard as possible to become the person I want to be. So good. Just... You're beyond taxes. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay. So I want to talk about communication in the sense of there's two levels to the game, in my opinion, and it's, it's knowing the information and then the next level is being able to communicate it in a way that's understandable. And for you to be named the number one CPA for millennials, it's not because you outworked everybody else with the amount of clients you worked with. It's probably because of the way you made the information you know, your expert accessible information, and also uh, desirable to want to watch, you know, or listen to. Like, mm -hmm. how do you process the things you know and make it digestible for people to understand? Have you ever wondered to yourself or asked yourself the question when you watch my content, how the heck does Omar's quality of video look and sound so dang crispy. It's literally the number one question I get asked, whether it's privately in the DMs or people commenting on my videos on Instagram or even on YouTube. The reality is I believe the quality of videos that I've been able to produce has been the recipe to my success online. And I wanna give you access to my live document where I've listed out everything I use, both for the podcasts I create, to the YouTube videos I make, as well as to what I use for my smartphone to make it look and sound amazing. The reason I put it on a live doc is because I keep this document updated in real time with everything that I'm using. So just head over to the video forward slash crispy, or just click the link down in the show notes. Let's get back to the conversation. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like kind of, kind of a cop out answer, but like that is probably my God given gift. Mm. Like God blessed me with the ability to take complex topics and distill them in a way that a third grader could understand. And it's just the way my brain works. Because if you would have told me that I could have hundreds of thousands of people follow me because I teach about taxes. Wild. One of the most boring <laughs> subjects you could ever think about. Um, I was able to build a following talking, talking about taxes. And I think it's just because... Um, I was able to distill it in a way that makes, because nobody likes to feel stupid. Mm. The moment people feel less than or feel inadequate, they stop listening and stop watching because you're making me feel dumb. That's good. So um, I've just been able to, to distill my a complex topic in a way that makes somebody feel intelligent and gives them the aha moment they've been wishing they can get for decades. Dang. You know, I so love I, that. I don't know if I, I don't know how to teach that, but I would say to to your point, you put it so eloquently. 
being the best at what you do and being knowledgeable at what you do is a prerequisite for success. It will not guarantee success. Mm. How you communicate what you know will guarantee success. And so you have to balance being an expert in what you do, but being able to tell it or teach it in a way that other people can understand. Because if not, then you just know and nobody else, then you can't impact anybody. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's really good. And it's what separates you because of the way you choose to communicate that principle or that, you know, strategy, because of the way you interpret it for the people you're trying to help, it, it it's, it's why I believe in no competition. Yeah. You know, it's 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 you're able to just say it the way you feel is the right way to say it for the people that follow you and that's where authenticity comes in right yeah. like there are people that are smarter than me like, i want to be very clear when it comes to taxes <laughs> there are a lot of people a lot of cpas a lot of accountants out there who are smarter than me but they can't communicate to my audience the way i can communicate to my audience. so good they might be able to communicate to you know you know uh nine figure earners in, in, in tax strategy. Cool. That's not my audience. Right. Um, so we all need to understand who we're communicating to. Like I love, love, love my brother, Wall Street Trapper. So good. I Bro, like he communicates stocks in a way that the, the dough boy on the corner <laughs> of New York City right. can understand stocks. Like, you know how powerful that is to be able to have a voice and be able to communicate your knowledge in a way that somebody who never thought they wanted to understand something right. can understand it. Like, that's my goal. I want to be able to communicate to my audience that way. That's so good. Who, who have you identified who you're talking to in your content? And yes. like, and maybe how is that, how has it evolved? Because some people have a hard time picking. Yes. Yes. So my, my target audience now is six and seven, six and seven figure entrepreneurs, right? The people who like got past the money, like, you know, got past the money problem in their business. And now their biggest problem is the tax problem mm. because real talk, you can't have a tax problem, bro. If you're mm. not making any money. So right. like, so my, 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 um, target audience is those six and seven figure entrepreneurs who's tax problem is bigger than whatever their money problems are. Um, but it, it didn't start out that way. It started out like with the new small business owner who just got started, who didn't know how to structure their business right and didn't know what a write-off was or a tax deduction was. Um, that's what it started out with because that's who I was, mm. right? Yeah. I didn't have the complex strategies back then. That's who I was. So I was serving where I was at. And as I grew, my audience grew as well. That's good. Right? And so who, the level of people I started to serve grew as well. So that's where we're at. That's where we're at now. That's so good. And so you tapped into organic stuff early on. Yes. And then when did you start implementing paid advertising? Dude, so I made it all the way to, I think, $50,000 a month without any paid ads. Dope. So when when people like say like start out running paid ads, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm polar opposite. Like I'm always talking about like start out with paid ads. I'm like, that works for you. For me, I say start off with content because here's what's going to happen. You're either going to pay to get good at content or you're going to pay Mark Zuckerberg for being bad. Dang. So what I mean by that is if your ads suck because you don't know how to make content and make a good ad, your cost per lead is going to be through the roof. Mm -hmm. So you might have a $20 cost per lead. For those of you all that don't understand like marketing, that means it costs you $20 to get a person to opt into your lead magnet. But if you're really good at content, you might have a $2 cost per lead. Like right now we're running an ad that has a $2 cost per lead. That's wild. So you're going to be paying, you paying Facebook 10x more than I'm paying because you don't know how to make content. And what people don't understand is the best, some of the best ads come from organic content that people just took from their page and put some ad spin behind. Because they tested it, it tested it. engagement went up, people, yeah. It's a simple equation. It's so good. If it works for your audience, it will work for the lookalike audience that Facebook is going to find anyway. So focus on making really, really, really good organic content, pick the winners, then put money behind them because the organic content is going to make you money anyway. Mm -hmm. So you could take the money that you're making organically <laughs> and create a self, what we call a self-liquidating offer, a self-liquidating ad because the money from the free content is funding the ad spend. That's brilliant. Yeah. Dude, that's fire. Yeah. So that's, that's like how we, we grew, but like, please guys do organic first. Yeah. 
Because you, like, why not test for free with your audience instead of testing on Facebook? And get that stuff out of the way. And, get, I, and yeah. we're talking about building a brand. Yes. So like paid marketing isn't building a brand. Do it. It's building a business maybe um, predicated on the money you're pouring into the fire. However, when you build a brand, you're, you're creating something so much more beyond. I had a conversation with a friend uh, two days ago and we we're talking about, you know, the differences in kind of how we grew our, you know, our personal brands. He grew his brands through ads, six figures a month ad spend. I grew my brand through organic content. And I told him, I said, your followers, you have a bunch of one night stand followers, mm. which means that a bunch of your followers came from people clicking the ad one time and then That's maybe it. joining your class or not. And then like, that's they go, they're going go. So his engagement on his page is super low. He has a lot of followers, but his engagement is low because he has a bunch of one night stand followers. I have a bunch of long term relationship followers, yep. right? These people have been with me since 2019 for the last five years, Good. watching me grow, uh, learning my story. So when I ask them to do something like come to my class or yeah. come to my challenge, I have a higher likelihood of doing it because these are relationship followers. Yep. So that's another reason why I believe organic is so powerful because the type of the type of follow all followers aren't created equal. Yeah. All subscribers aren't created equal. Good. Right. So you want to make sure you get those really like them them sticky long term relationship. That's good. Yeah. One of my favorite compliments I get as a creator has been Omar. I've been following you for a long time. Mm -hmm. Like that. You want to hear that as an entrepreneur. Yes. Like you're telling me you've been following me, promote my product services offers. Like obviously I'm giving out value, mm -hmm. but underneath the value is a business. Yes. And it's just crazy that we're living in a world where somebody could be a fan of you doing business. It's, it's, it's wild. It's, dude, like I have one of my favorite shirts, uh, one of my favorite pieces of apparel is Neil, Neil's behind the brand, the rapper it, slash uh, athlete, yep. the crossed out entrepreneur, because we are the, we are the athletes. We're yeah. the rapper. Like we, we, because because we're playing our own game. Yep. And people are watching us, and I think with that, everybody needs to understand. Like we're here for a good time and a long time. <laughs> so be patient, man. This, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. You can't you can't build a valuable personal brand overnight. Good. So take your time with it, man. And please, please do your followers a favor. Let them in on the journey. Yeah. Don't try to be perfect all the time because people can't relate to perfection because we all have our flaws. So show it ugly, show behind the scenes where you didn't have the dope mics and the lighting. It's like people want to see the journey because they're like, oh, dude, Omar, I remember when you were in the basement, bro, with the iPhone and now you have the studio because it, it, show, it reminds them that I'm in my basement right now. Mm, yep. And I'm gonna get to that studio because I watch Omar get there. And if he can get there, I can get there as well. I love it. Yeah. One, one of your, you know, strategies on Instagram is to repurpose other people's content. And I love it because not only are you, again, you're using content that has been tested, Yes. <laughs> but then you're, you're literally just side by side with the reposted content and you give credit, which is, I think you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then you're just like nodding your head and you're like, yeah, I agree with that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What, what's the process of how you make that? Cause I think that's just a great easy way to be consistent or at least to add to your content uh, strategy? I wish I can say that was my idea. Okay. I wish, but it wasn't. Um, so I did one, re I did one remix reel randomly because it was a piece of content that I, it was really good. Remix reel. Yeah. It's called, it's called a remix yep. reel. Yeah. It was really good. And I was trying to recreate it. It was taking me too long to like recreate it on my own, like do my own version of it. And I was like, dude, forget it. I'm gonna just like try this remix thing out. This dude nailed it to the T. So I'm gonna just repurpose this content. It went viral. I'm talking like 2 million views. That's wild. And I was like, well, let me, let me try it again. And this is when I had a full content manager. I was paying like $5,000 a month to follow me around and do all my content. Then I did another one and it did it did well again. Then a week later, I did another one and it did well again. And every month, one thing we do with our content is we pull up our all of our content for the last 30 days and organize it by popularity. The remix reel was, was the top three. That's wild. And I'm like, and so I talked to myself, I said, Carter, instead of making content that you want to make, 
why don't you put your ego aside and start making content that your audience wants you to make? Because in my head, I'm like, I'm, I'm spending you know, $5,000 a month on all this high level, high quality content. I'm not about to keep doing this, but that was my ego in the way. That's yeah. what I wanted to make. Yeah. What we have to do as content creators, we have to listen to our audience. If that's who we're serving, this is what we're doing this for, listen to your audience. My audience was telling me, we want this, mm-hmm. not so much of that. And then we just kind of like went all in on that about a year ago and we saw just a astronomical growth in our page. That's so good. How are you finding those other people to remix? Yeah, so uh, it's funny. My, my niece is on social media all day, okay. 24-7. So I'm like, hey, you got a skill set. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're on social media every day anyway, I need you to send 25 of these, 25 to 40 of these reels every week. And I'll go through and the ones I like, I favorite and I remix. Um, the ones I don't, I trash. But um, it's a really super easy and effective way to make content. So and everybody wins because the person who content it is wins because mm-hmm. they get put on a platform where we know our page gets 10, 10 million views a month. I think we have 10, wow. yeah, 10, about 10 million, uh, 10 million views a month. So they're, they're getting um, uh, more followers. I'm getting the content and my and our audience is benefiting from the content because some people don't know if everything they can hear on social media is true. Yeah. And because I've done the research, they know that if I, uh, that if I approve it, yeah. then they can take it to the bank. Yeah, that's really good. So how do you, how do you then transition viewership and audiences that you, the audience you've grown on Instagram? How do you transition them into becoming customers, clients, and this is where it gets fun, brother. Yeah. Uh, so, uh. The best way I could put it, so I, I just finished Alex and Mosey's book, Hundred Million Dollar Leads. Have you read that yet? I just poked in. Okay, so. this one. It's, I know. It's, I know his work is crazy. You yeah. know, he actually uses the studio or used him a handful of times. Because he's in Vegas. Yeah. yeah. So, but then he bought the UFC yeah. joint yeah. right yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> Huge tax deduction. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so so you have these followers, and I tell people all the time, if you're not like, if you have more followers than dollars, it's a problem, mm. in my opinion. Right. Dang, I love um, that. Worth to Drake, right? <laughs> um, so the goal is to have the followers, but the, also the goal is to turn them followers into buyers eventually. So the way we do it is we we don't own Instagram. No. We don't own YouTube. So if these platforms were to shut down tomorrow. Bro, I got I just released a podcast today at the yeah. time of filming this. Dude, I got my Instagram hacked five days in a row. Shut down, brought back, shut down, brought back. And it gave me perspective. It's like, dude, I don't own. Yeah, I need to get people off this yes. thing. Okay. Yeah, we don't own these platforms no. at all, bro. So my um, thought process was, I need to get as much data off of Instagram as quickly as I possibly can. And I think the easiest way to do that is have a really, really um, no-brainer freebie, mm. right? Because so many people try to sell, sell, sell from their page, like. You can do that, but like get once you get the lead, you can sell them later. Yeah, right. Like everybody wants to get the money now. It's like, yo, know, like amateurs make money on the front end, experts make money on the back end. That's good. I had to learn that the hard way. Well, I think be, be, I learned it the hard way because when you watch somebody doing it at a different level than mm-hmm. you, they make it look so easy and it looks like they're making money on the front end, mm-hmm. but really they're nurturing, they're doing stuff. They got the team in the back. Okay, continue. You no, know, for sure, for yeah. sure. So like if you look at my page right now, we're pushing everybody to a free class, which I teach live. Cause I, I, I love teaching. Like, I can't believe I get paid to teach. It yeah. just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so we're pushing everybody to a free class. And guess what? When you register for the free class, I get your name, I get your email, and I get your phone number. Now I can have an automated wow. 15 email drip campaign sequence yep. that is all, all, already done to turn you into a buyer eventually. Mm-hmm. And then here's where I think a lot of people mess up. The first mistake is people try to sell too quickly. They don't get the data first, get the lead first. The second thing is that when they buy the first thing, make sure it's good. Yeah. Because you only can make a first impression one time. So if your $20 ebook is trash, I'm not buying from you. Because I know if I paid you $20 for this, if I want to pay you $20,000, I already know it's not going to be worth my money because you couldn't even deliver on the 20. Yep. So what we have to do is we have to also make sure the first thing that somebody buys from us is at the highest quality possible. So they're like, yo, I just robbed this man 
by buying this thing. Yeah. Like, yo, I, 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 I owe him some more money. I got to buy something else, right? So I think that once you get the lead off of Instagram, off of YouTube or whatever your platform is, you need to then get them to buy a something super low ticket and then make sure it's really, really good. And then once you implement a funnel, then you're out of here. That's good. Yeah. What uh, what do some of those, because like that, that email sequence from a 30,000 feet up, what should that email sequence do? So somebody somebody gave you their information mm -hmm. and now you're going to be in their inbox for the next couple of weeks. Overall, what should this sequence do? Yeah. Um, in the famous words of Gary Vee, jab, 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 jab again, then right hook. So our first five emails are all value. Mm. Tax strategy, tax play, free gift. Value, 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 value. Then I think around email six through 10, we push a low ticket. Then we go value, 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 value again. And then the last email is like a no brainer offer email. So out of the um, 15 emails, I think only four or five emails are sales. That's fire. The other 10 are just value. That's good. I'll just say this. There's this thing called swipe copy. So yeah. I would encourage everyone go on your Instagram, go to Carter's Instagram, yeah. get his freebie, yeah. sign up for his whatever, yeah. and recontextualize his email sequence for your e email sequence. Oh, okay. So it's, we it's, call it funnel hacking. Like, funnel hacking. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Funnel hacking. Like, what? We should never be trying to reinvent something that's that. Like, somebody has something that's already working, bro. Yeah. I am on it. And like, it's funny. So you had Neo on the show, and um, a couple was a couple months ago, and um, so I, you know, been part of Neo's mastermind for a while, and he. One thing he always compliments me on, he said, bro, if I tell you something, I give you one play, bro. you run it <laughs> to the ground. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you're like you are a master implementer. And, and like, and that's the success. Like, if somebody like if you want to be successful, guys, please hear me out. Find somebody who's doing what you want to do at a high level and then recreate it as quickly as you possibly can. That's good. Because they already, they were the pioneer. They got the arrows in the back already. Mm -hmm. They're already doing something a certain way for a reason, right? And if you have to pay that person so they can tell you what to do, but like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel if we want to make money with content, selling online, or whatever the case may be. So good. Dude, so much valuable information. I feel like, you know, as, as you listen or watch this and you're a service provider, you sell something, what, what are these things that you can do? I think a lot of times we're talking and it's a conversation, but there are principles that could be taken from this conversation, mm -hmm. but let's transition into what it is you're an expert in and how you can help us all now, now that you've helped us make some money. Yeah. Cause right. Cause like, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't help you save on taxes if you ain't made right. no money yet. Um, but yeah. So. Yeah. So, so we're talking about making content. Like you would, you would agree with this statement. Uh, it's a non-negotiable to be creating content in your business. Unless you hate money. Unless you hate money. Yeah, if you hate yeah, money, you I don't have to finish the thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so so with that being said, why should a business owner be even more incentivized in investing in their business, regard, whether they're tiring that person or buying the, buying the equipment or what have you? Yeah, so um, the way that I like to explain the basics of taxes for business owners is that we get paid to grow our businesses. What I mean by that is that when you reinvest money into your business, the IRS gives you a tax deduction for that reinvestment. IRS code section 162A, which is the only IRS code section I feel like everybody needs to know, is that if you have a business, any expense that is both ordinary and necessary for you to operate your business is tax deductible. Mm. So you have a phenomenal podcast, you have a phenomenal show, and I'm assuming your channel grew because of the level of your production. 100. Right? So when you bought these mics, these are ordinary and necessary to operate your business. So the IRS is going to give you a tax deduction for these mics, the lights, the cameras. So every time you get a tax deduction, it lowers your income, mm -hmm. taxable income. And then when you lower your taxable income, it lowers your overall taxes. So the more write-offs you get, the less taxes you pay. Yep. And what most people don't understand the, the more you reinvest in your business, the more your business grows. So you're essentially getting paid by the IRS to grow your business. Yeah. So why not invest as much as you possibly can to grow your business as fast as you possibly can and to pay as a uh, uh, few amount of taxes as you possibly can? So that's kind of like the overall frame I want people to look through 
when they're like thinking about tax savings. I don't want you spending money just willy nilly. Yeah, and I think that's what has, I mean, I think mo what, there's a there's a, a percentage, but most businesses go out of business because they didn't have their stuff in order. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is even though you're making more money, you're actually almost starting over every year because you just didn't structure your business well. I mean, I, I experienced that. 2019 was my first six figure year mm -hmm. and my tax bill was $23,000. Way too high. I know. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm, I'm confused because I have a C, I have somebody helping me with taxes, mm -hmm. but I'm learning that there's a difference between tax strategy and tax preparation, Yes, you know? And it was, what was crazy is like, that was all that was in our savings. And, and then March came around, you know, 2020. And I was like, dude, I'm not gonna pay my tax bill right now. I'm gonna <laughs> keep this. But it's it's a whole, now, like the tax game is just, it's another game to the business. Like yes. the business is a means to building wealth, um, but it's what what it's how I structure the business. And then it's also what I do with those profits. Um, I have a very old school friend who sold his business after I think 20 plus years. It was a, a car, European car services. And I love, I love this friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him like, dude, these last two months have been, I'm almost halfway in my year goal in this, in these first two months mm -hmm. of the year. And he's like, make sure you're putting away 30%, like in a separate place. And I, I have, I don't have delayed gratification. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like, what about like buying an investment property, you know, in real estate, doesn't that like bring that down? You know, like, cause like, I don't want to hear that, yeah. but because I don't want to get tra in the trap of accumulating more just so I pay less. Mm -hmm. And yeah, how do you weigh that tension? I know it's like a- Yeah, it's yeah. A, so mouth, no, mouthful. no, that, that's a great question. So the way we say it in, in taxes is like, don't let the tax tail wag, wag the dog, which means like, don't spend money unnecessarily just to save taxes because right. like, what people didn't understand is that, so, your write-off, your your tax deduction only saves you whatever your tax rate is. So what I mean by that is if you're in the 37% tax bracket, highest tax bracket, you're spending a dollar mm -hmm. to save 37 cents. Yep. So you're not saving the whole dollar. Right. You're only saving the amount your tax rate is. Yep. So you want to be strategic with the ways in which we save on taxes because it's not a dollar for dollar exchange. Yep. So um but for for what what I what I like to what I like to tell people is that if the investment is going to help your business grow, then it it makes sense because it matches out. So if you so like again for advertising is tax deductible. Mm -hmm. If I put a dollar into advertising, I get three dollars back. That's a three x ROAS. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Break, what, the, what is ROAS? Just oh, sorry, like, sorry, a return on ad spend. Cool. Okay. Right. So one of my favorite things I tell people to do, like at the end of the year just put a bunch of money into ads, right? Because that way, and it actually you can over, so like, here's a strategy. At the end of the year, let's say you have, you know, $50,000 in profit, right? You can prepay your ad spend on a credit card, $50,000. And just put it in there. And just put it in there. And use a credit card. So you still have the $50,000 in your bank account but you just swipe the credit card for the $50,000 and that's good. I've never heard this before. And then that way, at the end of the year, you got no income, no tax bill. And then that $50,000 that you're gonna use in January, February, March anyway, mm -hmm. you're gonna, you're gonna net, then use that, um, use that money in your account and then the, you use the money that you make from the ads to pay off the credit card. Yep. And now you still have the $50,000 in your account as a, as, as a fund to fund other business expenses. Yep. So at the end of the year, we're pushing money into our Aspen account so that we can, you because we're going we're gonna to spend the money in January, February, March anyway, but I'm not about to give the money to the IRS. I'm going to pre-spend the money before the end of the year on a credit card, use other people's money, get the tax write off, save on taxes and make the money from the marketing and use that money to pay off the $50,000 in the first place. I think the key word here is pre-spend. Yes. That you have to have the foresight, the mm -hmm. vision, somebody to tell you, have you considered doing this? Yes. But that's really good. Especially when you do business year over year over year, you're finding like there are some things that you do all, every year almost. Maybe maybe even like trips you're gonna take, mm -hmm. uh, things that you go do, and uh, but that ad play is huge. Yeah, it, so I do, I do agree with your friend who said like put the 30% away in a separate account. But we're just not going to let it sit there and let inflation erode this 30%, right? Mm -hmm. If you're making a million dollars, that's $300,000. Wow. You have an account just sitting there losing 3% or 6%. 
due to right. inflation. So we're going to put that money aside, but then we're going to use that money for strategic tax plays, right? So if you're like, okay, hmm, if I build a studio in my basement, that would make that area of my home tax deductible. So this is one of my favorite strategies. I love teaching people like, cause again, my goal is to turn expenses that you're kind of already paying for and make them tax deductible, mm. right? So one thing I love about you is that you do you do a podcast setup. So somebody, I, I can pay you X amount of dollars to come to wherever, I, wherever, wherever I'm at and build me a studio. Yep. So if I have this 30% saved in, the, in this account, I would say, I'm gonna use some of this money to build a studio. Let's say I use $50,000 $50, to build out a studio, whatever. Now that whole $50,000 is tax deductible, first of all. But let's say now my basement is a content studio. Let's say my basement represents 20% of my home. Mm -hmm. Now my 20% of my home is technically a business. So 20% of my home expenses is now tax deductible. So now 20% of my mortgage interest, mm -hmm. tax deductible. 20% of my homeowner's insurance, tax deductible. 20% of my property taxes, tax deductible. It, I'm already paying these things anyway, right? Right. But now the government will come in and subsidize some of my home expenses, which is usually somebody's largest expense. And I'm growing my business at the same time because now I have a podcast studio to create more content to then run ads to, to then my business. Make. So like yeah. now we're getting like the government is paying us to be a business owner, bro. That's good. Do you like so? Neo mm -hmm. bought a house yes. that he runs masterminds oh, at. Dude, he does his podcast. Can you can you, you break down, down this play? Oh my god! Because I feel like that's the play dude. that I, I I most resonate with. Dude, <laughs> dude. Okay. Um. So yeah, and Neo's very smart by seeking out advice. So he talked to he talked to me about it, and he talked to my my, my, my good friend Carlton Dennis, who's a CPA. Um, so this strategy is genius. I'm trying to think of a way to explain it while I don't lose people. Okay, so one of my favorite quotes is that the more you invest, the less you pay the IRS. Okay, the more you invest, the less you pay the IRS. And that is especially true with real estate. So you can buy a real estate property and even though the property is gonna appreciate in value, the IRS is going to give you a tax deduction as if it's going to depreciate in value, right? So you get a depreciation deduction. Mm -hmm. So um, if so, let's say uh, the property costs. So this is the exact property I have in Chicago. The property costs a half a million dollars. Which, by the way, you worked with somebody I know, really? Tra Tra Travis Plum. Oh, dude, yeah. Travis, my guy. Yeah, no, yeah, it's just so, cool. Like, yeah, we've run in a lot of times in at certain events. Yeah, and then he joined my program for a little bit. Yeah, was, yeah, because he's a content. Yeah, 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 him and Levi are yeah, crushing. Yeah, I, I met him and Levi uh, yeah. uh, when I was in Dallas. So, so long story short, buy this property um, is a half a million dollars. The IRS says your depreciation deduction is take the purchase price minus mm -hmm. the land and divide it by twenty seven and a half. Okay, five hundred thousand divided by twenty seven and a half is. $18,181. Okay. So it's a little over 18 grand. The property makes me $1,500 a month in profit. Is it because you paid it off or? No, because it, so it makes me, me $4,500 a month in revenue. Okay. But the mortgage and all the yeah. expenses is $3,000. So I come out $1,500. Then you were able to get a, you found a, you found a deal then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. This That's fire. Deal. Yeah. Deal. Okay. So I make $1,500 in profit. Okay. So it's $18,000 a year. 1,500 times 12 is 18,000. Yep. So usually people are like, well, okay, Carter, you're paying taxes on the $18,000 that you made from the property. I would be, but I also get this depreciation deduction, which is $18,181 per year. So my depreciation deduction alone wipes out all of my taxable income and then some. Mm -hmm. So I'm making this $18,000 tax-free because I'm making it through real estate. Yep. So that's one of the ways that real estate helps you because you get to you get a, a depreciation deduction for the like for your property losing value even if it goes up in value. So like, that's like the base level. I love of, it. Yeah, of understanding real estate. So that, that's like that's like that's the beginner level. Yeah, and but let me give a I think a question that people are probably wondering: mm -hmm. How does that connect to my real estate? Or not? I want to say real estate business. How does this connect to my? laundromat business or agency. So I have an agency owner. How does that play connect to that? 
Yeah. So perfect example. So I have a $181 loss in this example because $18,000 in profit, $18,181 deduction. So I have, I have $183 loss on my tax return. Okay. Losses from real estate can get, uh, can get deducted from other income, like your agency. Okay. So now it lowers the income from your agency by $181. Great. Right? So, but the problem is with, with traditional long-term real estate, you you only get to do that up to $3,000. So if your real estate property lost $4,000, you only can use $3,000 to get your agency business. Okay. This is where Neo got really, really smart. Okay. So, you know, $3,000 loss ain't helping him. He's a multimillionaire. Yeah. He's like, I need, I need big losses. So what changed the narrative is that if instead of turning that property to a long-term rental, if you change that property to a short-term rental, there is no loss limitations. Okay. So if your real estate property lost 10,000, that $10,000 loss gets subtracted from all of your agency income. Okay. Just because it's a short-term rental. Because it's short-term rental and short-term rentals and long-term rentals don't have the same rules with the IRS. Mm. Now here's where you throw gasoline on the fire. <laughs> Cause then you can do something that's called a cost segregation study. Mm -hmm. Sure, you probably heard of it. Yeah, it's a fancy word for let's speed this stuff up. Can we curse on this? I'm not gonna curse. Yeah. Let, let, let's let's speed this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to wait 27 and a half years for this depreciation. We want to get it a lot in the first year. Mm -hmm. So what a cost seg does is it accelerates the depreciation. So now you're able to write off 30 to 40 percent of the value of the property mm. the year that you purchase it. Let's just say his mansion is five million dollars. Right, five million times thirty percent. I should know this. Twenty percent of five million is one million. So one point five. Yeah. Okay. So thirty percent of five million is one point five million dollars. That means he will get a one point five million dollar tax deduction, which he can use that one point five million tax deduction against his agency income. Yep. Well, what if he only made a million dollars as agency? He has a five hundred thousand dollar loss. That he can then, so now he just he just didn't pay taxes on a million dollars. <laughs> he just made a million dollars tax free, and then he has five hundred thousand more that he can use in the future for the next year's income. Right. So that is the play that he ran. That's the play that I, that's why I bought the property with Travis last year. Mm. It's a one point two million dollar property. It's probably going to save me three hundred, a little over three hundred thousand dollars in taxes. Um, not to mention the money we're going to make from it in the future. So Dude, that's, so that's like advanced stuff. Like that's, yeah. that's, so that's what I teach people. Like, yeah, no. And I, and I think, I think because that's, that's the information I was exposed to. Mm -hmm. And so like in my mind, I, I go back to the $300,000 sitting in the bank because I want to have it readily accessible when mm -hmm. I file my taxes. But if I know that's the number and I understand this is, this could be the play that I could run this year. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that's, that was di the, the difference between a long-term and a short-term rental. Yeah, so the, 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 the main difference in that play is that if it's long-term, you can't do that. If it's short-term, especially seven days or less, then you can, that, and that's why he rents it out days, mastermind, two days, boom, boom. Because the average stay per year has to be seven days or less. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay. he's renting it out short-term. Yeah. Right, oh, so good. Yeah. Dude, I need to run that play. Yeah, everybody like. And this is why a tax strategy is so important, so bro. Important. Like, like my that the the reason like the cost of not knowing, right? The cost of ignorance. You know, ignorance that. is not bliss, bro. Our parents lied to us. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance <laughs> yeah. is expensive, bro. Yeah. Ignorance is really expensive to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially 100. when it comes to taxes. So. This is why I love teaching it because, and this is the difference between a tax strategist and a tax repair. Right. A tax repair is not, doesn't know this, right? But a tax strategist sits you down and be like, "Yo, Omar, great year. You want to keep this money? Let's do this. Let's do this. This could work, but this might take a little bit more time. You might not want to do this. But then we also do this. Mm -hmm. All these things will bring your tax bill from two hundred thousand to ten thousand if you do them all." So let's start right now. Yeah. And this is why you can't wait to December to start figuring this stuff out. Because a lot of these strategies takes months to implement. Yeah. Right. So that's why we work with our clients throughout the whole year. Yeah. To be like, all right, dude, it's June. Let's see what this money is. Okay. We need to do this. We need to start this process now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I, what's funny is because the, there's two trains of thoughts, I think, in this. Because mm -hmm. I, I think like Alex Ramosi would say, 
stop spending time trying to figure out how much you could save the 300 K mm -hmm. and just focus on making another million. Yeah. And like, that's one route, but like, I don't know where I'm at. I'm trying to save the 300, you know? Like, I mean, my thing is let's do both, bro. Yeah. Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, 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 I don't believe in either or I'm a both and type that's, of guy. That's good. So like we going to take the money <laughs> and invest it into marketing so that we can make the million and spend the money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. like, we're going to do both, bro. That's really good. Yeah. Dang. Uh, it's so enlightening. If so, when, when I think about short-term rental, like if I got a house and it was a, you know, you know what peer space is? Yeah. What, what, how does that connect with real estate investing and using that as? So, I mean, the, where you host doesn't matter. Especially so for the, the play that we're talking about, like it doesn't matter if you do Airbnb, VRBO, peer space, whatever. As long as the average stay is seven days or less, you're fine. And I think peer space will actually give you a better chance because that's hourly rentals. Right. Right. So, so if I were you, if I were you, I would, I don't know if you own this property. I don't, it's annoying. Dude, so your, this is your only goal this year. Okay. Buy a concert studio, use it for yourself, because whatever the value is, you were made right off about 30% of that, that might change. There's a there's a tax legis the legislation that could pass that's gonna either make this better or make it worse. I'll keep you posted. But your goal should be to buy a concert studio, own it, use it for yourself, and make money while you're not using it. Yeah. So rent it out to other people. Right. Because which, now, which I kind of do that here, but then I like sometimes the headache of like handling somebody renting it out. Yeah, but like yeah. it's not about the money. Yeah. Right. Now we're talking about the tax deduction. Yes. So that should be your goal. Um, because there's two strategies you can do. You can you can do the self rental strategy, which is you renting it to yourself, and then you don't have to worry about anybody. Yeah, using your studio, right. or you can rent out to somebody else. But if you do the self rental or the short term rental, both strategies allow you to do the cost seg okay, that's good on the property, yeah. which is going to save you a lot of money in taxes. Dang. And you need to do it anyway, bro. Right. So like, that's dope. Yeah. Content house. Yes. Dude, I appreciate Loading. you. Huh? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like there is so much value in this. I think the principles that come from marketing, mm -hmm. and then, you know, like I, I just, I just, I see mm -hmm. people who are better marketers in life have a better life. Yeah. And um, when you tap into understanding that part of being an entrepreneur is learning how to convey a message and get that message out there and understanding how people think and knowing that people are inherently selfish, mm -hmm. but that means you can help them with whatever they need. And is that, that, that'll, that'll help grow your business, help mm -hmm. grow your awareness. You know, most people, and I love that Myron says this, he said, most people don't have a business problem. They have an awareness problem. Mm-hmm. And if more people knew about your business, you probably wouldn't be so frustrated. Period. Yeah. So uh, the marketing side of things, but don't forsake the the tax side of things. Yeah. Can I can I do something for your audience? Yes, please. Um, because we talked about marketing and we talked about taxes. Mm -hmm. So I have two books on these. Can Ca I give it to your audience just, for free? Just casual for free. For free. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. I'll I'll set it up by the time this goes live. So um uh I'll do just you know so they text the word Omar to three one two. 847-2309. We'll put it in the show notes. Put it in the show notes. And then um, I'll send them our, our free tax book and I'll throw in um, this content book we have as well. Dude, fire. Yeah. Are, are you a uh, ClickFunnels or go high level? ClickFunnels because I'm too lazy to look into something else. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. That's fair. Well, like, no, I mean, I love ClickFunnels. I love Russell. Um, he actually gave me some phenomenal advice. Um, Dope. So I'm I'm loyal to him. So I'm a ClickFunnels guy. Sick, dude. I appreciate you being on. I'm glad, dude. You, if for people that he literally flew here to shoot the podcast. Yes. Uh, hooked him up with another podcast, so yep. I'm excited for that. But then you get on a plane and fly back out to a mastermind. To a mastermind, to keep learning. Really quick, how do masterminds help business with tax strategies? Uh, first of all, I don't think this is going to be really quick. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, know, uh, I, mean, I know. But it's no, loaded. no, no. So I mean, like, so like, I'm getting so. This is, this is how it helps. So we've been taught by society to, that it's almost mandatory to spend $100,000 to go to university to learn from somebody who is not doing what we want to do. There's business there's professors that don't have a business yep. and who ain't making the money we want to make. Yep. Pay $100,000 to them and that $100,000 is not tax deductible. Because you get a small deduction for tuition, but if you make anything over eighty thousand, they wipe it out. So you, a hundred thousand dollars is not tax deductible mm. in the grand scheme of things. That's what society taught us. 
But the new way of learning is you mean to tell me I can go to a mastermind, pay $10,000, $20,000, learn from somebody who's literally doing what I want to do and who's making money that I can't even foresee right now. And every dollar that I pay them is tax deductible. So I'm getting a tax deduction to learn how to grow my business. That's good. Right? So yeah. like that's that's why I joined Summit Mastermind. This is the actual, what this is the proper education. Yeah. To learn from the right people that's doing the things you want to do. And I get to write it off on my taxes. Dude, I'll probably spend four hundred thousand dollars a year on my on my on my real education. Dude, I love that. So it's just something I have found with uber successful people, and I I mean me journeying into that. You know, I'm I'm definitely on Dude, my like way. It's, it's the it's the hack. Like think about it. No, think I, about, I, like, I experienced like, it. It's like, crazy. Like, like, like Myra spent thirty years in business. Yeah, I get to pay him to give me that thirty year experience, and over a three day period. And I get to keep it for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. We are like, when you join somebody's mastermind, you are robbing that person. <laughs> no, that's good. And they're okay. And they're okay with, I'm okay, with, okay it. Like, with it. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, like the, so that's like, really just good. do it. Yeah. Dude. So, so good. I appreciate you. Yes. All right.